want to start with an experience that I had a few weeks ago. I was driving home from work, and I saw that some kids had set up a lemonade stand on the side of the road. And my dad taught me that you should always pull over and support a kid's lemonade stand. And so I pulled over. Uh, he also said, don't ever drink the lemonade. And so <laughs> I pulled over, and sure enough, he was right. I got up there, and there were two choices. I had the pink lemonade, which was being stirred by the little boy that was sneezing. And I had the yellow lemonade that was being stirred by the little girl that was coughing. And so I thought to myself, well, which would my flower beds like the best? And I went with the yellow. And after I bought a cup, I did what I usually do. I playfully asked the kids, uh, what are you going to do with the lemonade or with the money that you earn? And the little girl, I wasn't prepared for her answer. She got a really sincere look on her face. And she said, our friend's dad lost his job. And we're trying to earn money so that they don't have to move out of their house. I bought five more cups. Uh, <laughs> Empathy is something that we're born with. In the last 20 years, neuroscientists have discovered that each of us are born with something called mirror neurons, which actually programs us to vicariously care about the other people's experiences around us. And when we cultivate that side of us, then we increase our capacity for connection. When we diminish or deaden that side of us, then it can lead to disconnection, isolation, loneliness, um, or even unethical or abusive behaviors. And so today, I want to help us reimagine the role that empathy can play in our society by reshaping it the way that we live it in our lives. And to do that, I need to talk graduate school for a second so I can explain how I generated my research. For those of you that haven't gone to graduate school, um, let me just break it down for you. It's basically like the Hunger Games. And uh, <laughs> it really is. And you're just trying to survive. You're trying not to get eaten. Spears, some people are shaking their heads. Yeah, right? Professors are throwing spears at you. If you can make it to the end, then they say to you, before we let you become a doctor, you've got to do this massive research project and write this massive book called a dissertation, and this should somehow produce new knowledge and change the world. No pressure. <laughs> and so when I got to that place, I was losing sleep, and my sister asked me, well, what is it that's changed your life? And the more I thought about that, uh, the more I kept coming back to empathy and the role that it's played at various stages in my life, for reasons I'll explain in a minute. And so I thought, yeah, look at the nature of the world today. And look at the problems that people have in relationships on a daily basis. Wouldn't empathy be a wonderful thing to inject into the world and into relationships? So I decided to study empathy, and this is how I did it. I created an upper division class that focused on empathy. And I had all my students uh, keep empathy journals for the course of the semester. And I did this for two semesters in a row. So it took me eight months to collect my data. Uh, I had them do a bunch of different things with those journals. Two of the things that I had them do was I had them reflect on empathy experiences in their life and to also and write about those, and then also to apply empathy to their current relationships and kind of write about how it affected those relationships over time. So when I was done, I had a stack of empathy journals, hundreds of pages of empathy experiences. And John Dewey said that we do not learn from experience, we learn from reflecting on experience. And I had their deep reflections of their empathy experiences. I've spent the last two years of my life analyzing these journals as rigorously, as meticulously as I could to try to understand empathy on the deepest level so that I could teach it. And so today, I want to share just three things that I've learned uh, throughout this process. And that is three things that can transform our lives and our relationships. And that is um, our ability to give empathy, our ability to receive empathy, and our ability to co-create empathy. So let's talk about giving empathy for a second. If I was to ask you, what does it mean to give empathy? I actually asked my students this on the first day of class. I'm guessing many of you would say what they said, which is, I don't care, how do I get an A in this class? No, I'm just kidding. Uh, I actually had one student say that, bless his heart. And uh, so I'm get, many of you would say what they said, which is empathy is standing in somebody else's shoes, seeing the world through their eyes, and feeling what they're feeling. And that's one of the most common things you hear people say when they talk about empathy. But I want to suggest that A, that's not possible. And B, when we think we can do that, we actually start making assumptions about what other people have experienced. Assumptions that can lead to disconnection um, or misunderstandings. And so if we can't stand in somebody else's shoes, then what's empathy? Well, empathy is the righteous struggle to try to try to understand what it's like to be in their shoes, to try to understand what it's like to, to what they're feeling. And that's a process that happens through communication. So empathy doesn't make assumptions. 
Empathy forges communication that is inquisitive, that is non-judgmental, that is validating and compassionate. And when we start to communicate in that way, the primary thing that it does is it changes us. It softens us. We see the people in our lives differently. We rewrite the narratives that we tell ourselves about others in the kindest ways possible. Because when we cultivate empathy, we enlarge our capacity to love, to forgive, to be accepting. Because empathy in many, in many ways is the foundation of those things. And so when we change, it invites change into the relationship. We now create new patterns of communication, new ways of relating in healthy ways. But for some people, giving empathy is not the hardest part. It's something that we don't ever talk about, which is our ability to receive empathy. And that can be just as transformational, if not more so for some people. And so there are lots of reasons why we need to receive empathy. I just want to focus on one today that I think will be the most meaningful, one that came out of my research. And that has to do with perfectionism. We live in a society and a culture that in many ways can be identified as a perfectionistic culture. Let's imagine for a second that you belong to a community where there's a lot of people that are trying very hard to be good people. Now, there's nothing inherently wrong with that. In fact, it's really good in a lot of ways. But when we get a skewed perspective of what that means, it creates problems. We can actually start to put up a bar and we say everybody above this bar is a good person and everybody below the bar is not quite good enough. And the higher we raise the bar, the more judgmental and critical we become of those in our life. But also, the higher we raise the bar, the more critical we become of ourselves. Everybody's condemned, including us. And then we start feeling like we're not good enough. And that leads us to A, we can start to perform perfect in public, hoping people won't recognize that we have all these imperfections and, and weaknesses or we just start to withdraw. When we do that, then we, it's really hard to create authentic relationships. But, or we could just start to withdraw altogether emotionally and we put up these walls. And then it's hard to almost, it's almost impossible to have intimate relationships, emotionally intimate relationships. So how do you change this mentality then? We get locked into this black and white thinking and we don't realize that there's a whole lot of gray. In my research, I found that there were 49 shades of gray actually. I'm not gonna advocate for 50, sorry. Um, but yeah, so how do we get out of this black and white thinking? Uh, it's empathy. You introduce empathy to a culture of perfectionism and all of a sudden it's okay to be imperfect. We put people in our life or we recognize that there are people that are already there that are trying to give us empathy. We have to lower the walls and receive. Brene Brown's research on shame does a fantastic job of describing how this process works. And my research supports what she found, which is empathy is one of the primary ways to reduce perfectionism. But that only works if we learn to receive. And that takes me to my third point, which is the transformative power of co-creating empathy. And to teach this, I decided to use an example to make it come alive. And I decided to be more vulnerable than I usually am when I speak. Um, and I wanna talk about how empathy has influenced my life. And I wanna do that in a way that allows me to be imperfect. I want to contribute to a culture where it's okay to make mistakes and learn from those. When I was 16 years old, I dropped out of high school. Something I never talk about, I was ashamed of it, and it's taken me a while to get my, come to peace with that, but I was a high school dropout. I'm sure my students just fell out of their chairs. Um, <laughs> but there's always a backstory. With any action, there's a backstory, and when we try to understand somebody's backstory, it can help us develop empathy. Here's my backstory. When I was 12, my dad became very sick and he was pretty much bedridden for the rest of his life. And so we had a big family. I was one of the oldest. My brother and I decided to drop out and start working construction to help support the family against my mother's wishes um, and the opinions of a lot of other people. But the truth is, I don't wanna make myself out to be more noble than I was. I also dropped out because I was an angry teenager. I looked at some of my friend's life and I felt like I had been given a raw deal. And so that contributed. About a year after I dropped out, I overheard my mom talking to one of our religious leaders who'd come to see her. Our house was small. They didn't know I could hear the conversation. And he said to her, your boys are bad kids. And unless you fix them, they're never going to amount to anything. And even though I was an angry teen, I respected this man. And it hurt. It cut me to the core. And I said to myself, I don't know how, 
I don't know what way, but somehow I'm proving this guy wrong. I'm gonna amount to something. And so I had this chip that got put on my shoulder and I waited for my opportunity to come. Six years after I, drop out, after I dropped out, empathy intervened. I had relatives that had empathy for my situation and they made it possible for me to go to college if I wanted. At that point, I was, I was yearning for it. I wanted to make something of myself. So I did what I needed to do and I started school as the most scared freshman you'll ever wanna meet. I was so scared that on the first day of class, the teacher had to call my name four times in roll call because I didn't recognize it was me. Right? I was like Ferris Bueller. Bueller, Bueller. That was my moment. And so my first paper was an F. I took it home and I thought, there's no way I'm going to be able to do this. I'm a high school dropout. Maybe I should just cash in my chips now, go home and start working construction again. But once again, empathy intervened. Uh, one of my best friends and my brother came to me and they gave me empathy and they sat with me in my discouragement. And because of that, they encouraged me to keep going and I did. I worked as hard as I could. I barely made it through that first semester. I doubled down. I worked harder the second semester. My grades got a little better. By the time I got my bachelor's degree, my grades were actually good enough that I could go to graduate school if I wanted. And now I could taste it. The chip on my shoulder was bigger. I was gonna make something of myself. And so I, I went to graduate school in California and I, could, I started to study leadership. I was gonna go into management. I wanted to make money. I wanted to be rich. I wanted to have, I guess that's the same. I wanted to have uh, status and I wanted power. I wanted to be able to go home and show everybody back home that I'd made it because the chip on my shoulder had gotten huge. But the problem was that the more I tried to make myself into somebody important, the more I lost myself along the way. And then that wasn't all that I lost. The universe sent me uh, the ultimate wake up call and in a very short period of time, I lost the three closest relationships in my life. My dad died of cancer, the relationship I was in ended, and then my uh, brother died unexpectedly. And when you lose your closest relationships, you gain perspective. And suddenly I realized that making money, proving people wrong, that wasn't really that important. And that I had neglected the relationships that had brought meaning into my life. And so once again, empathy intervened and there were graduate students, a teacher who came to me and they sat with me in my shame and they were present and they listened and they helped me find clarity. And I realized that something that positive psychology figured out a long time ago, which is that the happiest people are those that have meaningful connections in their lives. And so I switched my focus. I decided to get a PhD in a degree that would allow me to teach principles of connection so that I can encourage people to value the people in their life. And that's what I've done and that's led me here. And one of the primary things I've learned along the way is this, is that empathy at its most transformational level is not one-sided. I had been the recipient of empathy and it had helped me progress, but I hadn't learned to truly receive or reciprocate. And it's, it's, it's not until we can get into relationships where they're both people are giving empathy, where it's co-created, where giving and receiving collapse together because both of us are aware of each other's needs and we're constantly trying to meet those in healthy ways day after day. That is the real transformative power of empathy. It's not a hard hat that we put on. Oh, the wife's emotional again. Put on my empathy hard hat, punch in my empathy time card and go, <laughs> go do some empathy, right? That's not what it is. I mean, it can work that way. But it's more powerful when it's a pair of glasses, not a hard hat, that we wear all of the time. It shapes the way we see everything. It shapes the way we communicate. And when the other person is wearing the glasses too, now you have connection at its deepest level. One of the coolest things I found in my research is that we each have different empathy languages. Just like there are different love languages, there are different empathy languages. And when we co-create empathy in relationships, we learn to speak each other's empathy languages. Some of those are verbal, some of those are nonverbal. I'll give you an example of two verbal ones. That a lot of times th this is, gets reductive, this is reductive how people teach this. Some people need to hear, I have no idea what that's like. Please help me understand so I can be more fully with you in this moment. But that doesn't work for other people. Other people need to know that somebody's been in the trenches too. And for those people, they need to hear, oh, I know what that's like. I've been through that. You're not alone. I'm here for you. Two different empathy languages. And when we come to know each other, 
we can start to learn to speak each other's empathy languages. So what my hope is, is that we have lots of programs on how to teach people empathy. In the professional field and education, what we need is we need more programs that teach relationships how to co-create empathy. Rather than just targeting individuals, we need to target relationships. We need to teach couples, families, classrooms, communities, corporations, companies. We need to teach them how to create a culture of empathy. That's the transformational stuff. And when we do that, then people will not only learn to give, not only learn to receive, but they'll learn how to contribute to a culture where everybody is aware of each other's needs and emotions. And that will have a ripple effect which can change the world. Thank you very much.